Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So I find it interesting to map mathematics onto the Dhamma. Because mathematics is the study of how patterns operate in reality. And at the heart of Dhamma is the principle of thusness. The Buddha said in the Samyutta Nikaya, whether or not a Tathagata, an enlightened Buddha, arises in the world, this element remains, the thusness of Dhamma, um, dependent origination, tatata, the not otherwiseness of Dhamma, ananyatata. And the word tatata, is the same word he used for his epithet for himself, tathagata, meaning the thus gone or the thus come. And it's almost like in that moment he's pointing us to a concept so simple that it's beyond an, a word. It's almost onomatopoeic, ta ta ta, this ground. The heart knows this. When you understand how something fits into the broader equation of conditionality, the heart suddenly can rest because it intuits that there's nothing wrong in the sense that we've all had this experience, I think, of not understanding why a coworker is the way they are or why a friend is acting the way they are acting, and then you find out what their childhood was like or what's going on at home, and there's a sense of, oh, of course, of course. And the heart comes back to the ground of ta-ta-ta. It understands in that moment the, the law of conditionality at work. And when the heart understands that, it's much stronger than we think and able to hold the world in all of its brokenness because at some level it understands how natural law is operating. And uh, I think Longport Sumedho is perhaps the best at summarizing this when he says, it's like this. Ha ha ha. Then I think is even a, uh, Better phrasing is, it's never been more like this than it is right now. (laughs) And the master equation that the Buddha said dictates our paths in life and binds us to the wheel of samsara, he called Paticca Samuppada the 12 links of dependent origination. Perhaps the most complex psychological system, I think, that has ever been developed. Um, At least, yeah, I stand by that statement. And it's profound. There's a sutta where Ananda, Venerable Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, says, "Uh, Master, it's amazing and clear how easy it is to comprehend dependent origination. And the Buddha says, do not say that, Ananda, do not say that. This dependent origination is profound, hard to see, subtle. It is because of not understanding dependent origination that this generation is like a knotted skein, a mess of knotted reeds that they wander blind. So it would be a good thing to try to understand and we have 30 minutes. (laughs) 
Ajahn Longpore Suchito gave a whole, I think, week or two week retreat titled uh, Beginning Dependent Origination for Advanced Meditators. <laughs> so. One feature of mathematical systems and chaos theory, which is the conception of reality that Buddhist thought gives to the world, a swirling mix of conditions all interpenetrating, is a quality called scale invariance, which means a pattern played out on a micro level plays out in every scale you look at. It's like a Mandelbrot set, a fractal. And one of the most profound moments in practice often will be when someone realizes that the same pattern they're navigating in their meditation, how, how it's the same pattern that's dictating their whole life, how the way they're controlling their breath is how they're controlling their child, how the way they're berating themselves for having a wandering mind is how they're constantly berating their loved one, how the way they're falling into drowsiness is how they're blanking out in a job they know is empty. And that moment of connecting the two scales of pattern and understanding that if we soften and understand and hold the pattern on the cushion, the wider pattern that has constricted and bound our life softens and can dissolve too. You're observing the tiger in the zoo instead of while it's running around out in the wild just doing what it wants. And another feature of chaos theory are points called resonance points. Ajahn Jeff points to this in an essay called Samsara Divided by Zero. And these are places in the mess of chaotic equations where suddenly things divide by zero and the whole system breaks down. And this, in Ajahn Jeff's telling, is where these points where the conditioned realm can issue into the unconditioned, where our ignorance can suddenly issue into knowing and enlightenment. But I'd like to also suggest that such a conception of resonance points can apply just to even a moment, to some extent, of knowing when we understand the equation. When the heart is aware, then we can step out from it and think short circuit. So this is the beauty of understanding the equations that have chained us, is when we do, when we can, the chains break. So each morning in Bodh Gaya, you'll hear the monks and uh, chanting over the loudspeakers, dependent origination, avijja pachaya sankara, ignorance conditions, conditional formations. Conditional formations condition consciousness, consciousness conditions mentality and materiality, namarupa. Namarupa conditions salayatana, the six sense bases, the six sense bases condition contact, contact conditions vedana, feeling, vedana conditions craving, craving conditions uh, clinging, clinging beco conditions becoming, becoming conditions birth, birth conditions old age, sickness, death, and despair. Yeah, okay, that's an end point to an equation. So if you didn't remember all that, it's okay. Ajahn Chah was once asked about dependent origination, and he said, look, it's like you're falling out of a tree and counting all the branches on the way down. It's just enough to know that when you hit the ground, it hurts. So we know that when things begin with ignorance and proceed unawares, they end in dukkha, suffering, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And many of you know one of my favorite Ajahn Punadhamma quotes where he says, People are so unfair to us Buddhists, they say, all you talk about is suffering. But that's not true. We also talk about sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. <laughs> so this is often depicted as a wheel of 12 links. But if we can step out of the wheel, and in Majjhima Nikaya 9, the Right View Sutta, Venerable Sariputta says that if you apply the Four Noble Truths, if you understand 
any of these links, the whole cycle breaks. So first to lay out how this is relevant. In traditional cosmology, this is a system for talking about an avijas algorithm, how we move from life to life. Ignorance and sankara, past volition, issue into present life consciousness, which takes a body and so on, until new birth. It's a three life system. But because of scale invariance, because these patterns operate at every level, this process can also be seen to operate every moment. So how many births have you taken today? And in Buddhist cosmology, we have quite a variety of births you can take. You could have been a, a hungry ghost this morning. You could have been an asura, an angry deva. You could have been um, a demon. You could have been any n number of animals. You could have been human. And if you understand how these links operate, then you can see it, the clockwork moving in your life and step out of it. So to run through them, ignorance, unknowing, this is the root of suffering in Buddhist thought. It's often depicted in Tibetan iconography as a blind person walking along. And it's such a compassionate way of looking at the world because instead of looking at others as intentionally malevolent, we understand that we're all just walking around. I think there's someone who said, um, humanity is just a bunch of children trying to spell God with the wrong, out of uh, letter blocks with the wrong blocks. And I don't know how we'd map that onto a Buddhist thought, but something about spelling Nibbana, which is a lot harder to spell, but also better. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so what ignorance is, is ignorance of the Four Noble Truths as an applied skill. So the Four Noble Truths are understanding dukkha, understanding suffering, understanding that craving causes it, understanding or realizing uh, peace. Um, and the second, sorry, is releasing craving, tanha. The third is realizing peace, the cessation of suffering. And the fourth is developing the path. And this blindness means that, you know, it's sort of like you're walking around in a grocery store and someone bumps you in the back and this surge of anger comes. And then you turn around and realize they're blind. And where does the anger go? You understand, and we're all just a bunch of good intention, blind people wandering around a supermarket together, bumping into one another. And there's a great compassion hidden in that way of looking at the world. Ignorance, compassion, or, uh, ignorance conditions, sankhara, volitional formations, which is a broad term. And this link always confused me um, until I read a sutta where it said that the Buddha speaks and says, those contemplatives and Brahmins who do not understand, this is suffering, this is the cause of suffering, this is the cessation, this is the path. They delight in formations leading to birth, aging, and death. Delighting in these formations, they drop off the precipice of birth, aging, and death. So when we constantly look because of our ignorance for satiation outside of ourselves, we constantly go out, we intuit a hole in ourselves, and we move outside looking to fill it. And we buy into it because we don't see clearly the Four Noble Truths there. We don't see clearly that when you tie the heart to that which is breakable, then the heart will break too. And it's really that simple, and Long Pordoon had a great way of reframing the Four Noble Truths. He said the cause of dukkha is the mind going outside of itself. The cause of dukkha is the mind going outside of itself. The cessation of dukkha, or the path to the cessation of dukkha, to nibbana, is the mind watching the mind. So can you see when that ignorance of where we look for happiness leads you to look out again when the discontent leads you to go to the fridge, to go to the internet, to go to the phone, 
to buy the new car, to look to the new relationship, that is ignorance conditioning sankara. It's the lack leading to a movement out. Sometimes I think of it as when you drop a stone in water, there's the void in the water and then suddenly it, the droplet of water rebounds and a drop comes back up. So that's you know, the suffering, ignorance leading to sankara, the rebound of volition. And it's not to say we don't engage with the world. Longpur Cha said, look, I hold these things, but you hold them lightly, and you know when to let go. We don't tie our hearts to them. We interact with the world. We value it. We care for those around us, but we don't look to it for lasting happiness. We use it as a path. So the Buddha then said that sankhara issues into uh, vijnana, sense consciousness, sense consciousness into name and form, and name and form, mentality, materiality, into the six sense bases. So in a daily life conception, we can kind of take all these as one constellation of things happening. Sankara is an intentional formation. We move into the world wanting something. And based on that wanting, it conditions the type of consciousness we put out into the world. So if you're angry in the morning, if you're really grumpy, you'll find you notice things to be grumpy about really easily. You're not coming as a blank slate. You are primed with a sankara that wants to be really annoyed at your partner. And you will find a reason. And that's, you're putting into the world a certain kind of consciousness. You're looking for the sensory stimulus that will affirm and feed into the clockwork, the equation you're already running. Uh, you've got your program going already. You just need the fodder for it. And almost anything will do. And this is really funny on retreat because you uh, have so little to work with that I know, just know people who they're not allowed to read and they'll just find themselves like glued to the back of a shampoo bottle. Just any, anything. And uh, Consciousness conditions name and form, and that's how, based on that impetus of finding something in the world to affirm your equation, what you're looking for, the body and the mind all come into concord around that. You're annoyed, so the breathing quickens. There's a tightness in the stomach. There's a sense of needing to release something. The mind begins to bring up past memories of when this person didn't wash the dishes again. Name and form are coming into alliance with the equation. Mentality, materiality, the body and mind. And the six sense bases, uh, eyes, ears, uh, taste, touch, smell, and the mind are all putting themselves out there looking for that same stimulus. So those links all come together looking for an experience. And this leads to what we call contact, um, which is the fifth, sixth? Wait, okay, wait. Ignorance, sankara, vijnana, namarupa, salayatana, sixth, halfway through. Contact with the outside world. So noticing the moment you actually come into contact with something of the world, you're already halfway down the equation. We are not blank slates. We come primed. And just noticing that priming is so helpful because then you just don't buy into it as much. Like maybe you do find yourself fixated on the latte you want this morning or fixated on your partner's actions or your neighbor's dog but you know that it's not really the latte, and it's not really your partner, and it's not really the neighbor's dog. It's ignorance. You know that you'd find something, and that's really useful because you can put up your guard and be very careful until you know that that equation has run itself off. And often, your job in those moments is just not to act. Not to act. And I'd raise up anger as a really important one to put a strong wall around. In monastic circles, before we admonish another monastic, we have to do it at the right time. We have to do it honestly. We have to do it from a place of loving kindness. I know a monk who's taken a year until he could fulfill that requirement. 
and we have to ask permission. That's such a good firewall for relationship, having that, and that will make you sometimes be still enough that you can come from a different place. So you want safeguards on these equations. Contact with the outside world issues into Vedana, which is effective feeling tone. And feeling, Vedana, which is the seventh link in Buddhism, isn't emotion. It's just pleasant, painful, and neutral. Very primal and basic. This is as a one-celled organism has this to some extent. It moves towards food, away from danger, and everything else it ignores. Basically, we kind of care about what we can eat or mate with and what's going to eat us. And everything else kind of falls in the background. That's an oversimplification, but maybe only slightly. And emotion, as we think of it, is much more a sankara uh, in Buddhist thought. It's an amalgamation of many different factors constructed into a, a, a tangled skein of conditions, a program of its own. But Vedana is just moving towards, away, or sense of indifference. And Vedana leads to tanha, which is thirst, craving. This is the weak link in the chain. This is where we break the equation. So you notice when a sense of just not liking something, maybe the dog barking is distracting. When does the mind grab that? When does tanha start thirst? And that can mean feeding off of something, craving to get something or craving to get rid of something or craving to become something. And you can really feel when that happens. It's like you're becoming drunk on something. You're buying into it. You're, bu you're feeding it. That's the craving moment. And if you can stop and live at the link of feeling, Vedana, just notice, oh, this is an unpleasant feeling. This is a really unpleasant feeling. This is that, it's really awkward right now feeling. Uh, this is the, I really wish that person would uh, stop humming under their breath feeling. Just noticing and noting and not letting yourself get drawn into craving. That ability to break the equation, the chain there, is so powerful. Because once you've bought into craving, things really get going. Craving leads to upadana, clinging. Clinging leads to becoming, becoming leads to birth. Birth leads to suffering and death. So this is a fascinating, fascinating crescendo where craving is when you think, you know, maybe you're not feeling so good, so the image of the piece of cake you want to get when you leave the gathering comes up, or the many cupcakes we have in the back pop into your head. And then clinging happens. And this is when you start to fondle that idea, like thinking about the cupcake a little bit more, sort of, what was it like last time? What flavor was that again? I wonder how fast I can get over there. Will they be gone? There's a lot of them, so I doubt it. Um, but you can feel that, just fondling it. In meditation, you really, you'll get to know that feel, and that leads to becoming, and that's when you really become, get to a decision. It's the height of, it's the apex of the process in the sense of the dopamine hit. And they've, they've measured this in consumer studies, and in a grocery store, the bhava moment uh, peak dopamine is right when you're at the cash register knowing you're going to buy something about to make the purchase. That is the best it's going to get. And it's all downhill from there. That's bhava, becoming. Jati, birth, is once you've bought it, once you've eaten the cupcake, you've made the decision, you've decided to break your sila, something like that. You know that moment where suddenly you're in a new life now and the decision's been made and death is inevitable. And there's such use in this because that last link, it's everything, it's the fact that things change. And if we start to pay attention to it, because what we remember is based on the peak end rule, we remember the best moment 
and that was bhava. So when things fade, when the experience fades, we automatically think to the next birth. We want something new. What's the next hit? And we jump into a new birth, into new craving, into new sankara. And it takes such poise and mindfulness just to remain for a moment and honor that link of fading. And often it'll just be the little letdown, the little blank. But sometimes when you've disappointed someone, when you've failed, when you've expressed the anger and feeling the fallout, it's a bruise that moves through your body. You, f you know that feeling. It, it kind of moves through and there's no way of rushing it. You just have to hold yourself through that bruise. And if you can stay still and calm the palsied trembling of your hands wanting to grasp onto something else, then you find that if you let it fade, there's not nothing. The empty hand fills with sunlight. But it takes real poise. You can also see this after you've ended one phase of your life. There's a moment of uncertainty where you don't know what's next. And the impulse is to jump into something new, a new career, a new relationship. Often the dharmic thing to do is just to stop. Stop until that compulsion to be born again fades. And you can just let things settle until the clear, calm heart can move from a place of lucidity and brightness, because that's what will come. On the other side of that dark valley of death, there is a majesty and a, there's sunlight. I think T.S. Eliot articulates this better than almost anyone I've known in the four quartets. He says, wait without hope for you're not ready for hope. Hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, because love would be love of the wrong thing. There's still faith, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. The faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. So, if we can find a way to still in that moment and stop, that's an enormous resource we have in practice, is the ability to stop. And then, once you have, the Dharma will guide you more. It's one of the things I find so interesting about the words tat tat ta is that settledness, when you understand conditionality, there's also an intuitive awareness that does you can feel when you're aligned with that song. The first person the Buddha spoke to after his enlightenment was a wanderer named Upaka. And he met him on the road, and Upaka was so impressed by the visage of the Buddha, he said, are you a god? And the Buddha said, no. I am come to beat the drum of the deathless in a world blind. And Upaka said, good on you, friend. And he walked on, and that was the first poor Upaka. I think he came around eventually. I'm not totally sure on that. Did, what happened? They say he came around eventually. But, uh, but for me, the ta-ta-ta is the drum of the deathless, ta-ta-ta. And there's tribes in Africa that talk about that intuitive awareness as a tapping in the chest. And if you feel that alignment, when you let go of the equation, it's not that there's nothing left. There is a resonance that guides us or that you can intuit. And the final thing I'll say is just the ways of working with this chain is just throughout your day, notice those links. Name every time you hit a link. Oh, this is contact. This is feeling. Or this is birth. And it's so helpful just to know. And then if you, um, at any of those points, if you widen awareness, you can step out of the equation. If you, when you find yourself in contact, open awareness to all six sense bases, not just the eyes seeing the cupcake. Open to the sound, the feel of the wind on your skin, 
and watch as the equation dissolves. In feeling, just name it. Or you can use phrases like, about to suffer, about to suffer. <laughs> or that cupcake would be great, and that's Anicca. That cupcake would be great, and that's Anicca. Just add on a Dharmic phrase. Just add that little bit of space. And then the algorithm uh, ceases, and we find ourselves in a field where we can genuinely meet ourselves and the world and each other with kindness. And uh, I wish this for everyone here. Sato, 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 Anumotami. So the question for those on Zoom or who couldn't hear um, is something like uh, if we, well, sorry, um, as we practice, often the cravings seem to become more refined and less unwholesome. You know, maybe we've given up the desire for the new Lamborghini, but a rafting trip to the Grand Canyon sounds great. Exercise becomes, you know, maybe a real source of well-being. So how do we balance this sense of dispassion and stepping back with cultivating these seemingly quite wholesome births of sort? Is that something about... Thumbs up. Okay. Ajahn, do you want to start... Yeah, I think the, the one element I actually forgot to bring in um, was, because we already went through 12 links, was another 12 links called dependent, or, uh, Transcendent Dependent Origination, which is the counter equation. And this is a thing where suffering leads to faith and a search and the cultivation of the bright mind. And um, for me, you know, a really common misconception is that Buddhism is all about giving up desire, but it's about giving up tanha, um, unwholesome desire or thirst, craving. And we're cultivating chanda, which is wholesome zeal. And often, instead of a sense of feeding, it's a sense of wanting to make something whole, of producing. That's a, a characteristic, like delight or satisfaction in the act of doing something, like going for a run, you know. And... Um, and so, yeah, like a huge part of the path is just building ourselves out of more wholesome pieces, little by little. Um, you know, and, and you divide the Noble Eightfold Path into sila, samadhi, panya, ethics, concentration, wisdom. And wisdom is the sense of dispassion about seeing how even getting attached and craving, um, attached to and craving exercise can be a source of suffering. But the first two factors of ethics sort of our external actions in the world and samadhi, uh, wholesome mental states, are all about building a wholesome self. So yeah, you want to get a good regimen of exercise, of meditation, that's all sila of a sort, or resonant with the idea. But you just, you know, like with so many things in the spiritual path, it's like depth perception. You have one eye seeing everything in terms of stepping back from the, the wheel. But then you have another eye seeing things in terms of what are you building? And, and you kind of just have to hold both. Like you can cultivate these wholesome states, but if you do it with mindfulness, you'll see when those unwholesome qualities of craving move in there. And then there's just this real acknowledgement like there's a wholesome way of desire or of, of enthusiasm, of zeal that is part of the path. So yeah, I'd say, a lot of the things you mentioned fall right into that. And there's more wholesome pleasures and le le less wholesome ones, too. Yeah. Ajahn? Yeah, just real real quick, it's a great question. And uh, most people, when they hear about Buddhism, it sounds somewhat pessimistic or even nihilistic. It's all about dukkha, all about suffering. Um, and the Buddha does talk a lot about suffering um, and things which are unsatisfactory and the unsatisfactory nature of everything. But you can also conceive of the path as a path of increasing skill at happiness, even increasing skill at, at pleasure. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha says that if by renouncing a lesser happiness, you gain a greater happiness, the wise person will abandon the lesser happiness, seeing the value of the greater happiness. And Nibbana is the, the highest happiness. So yeah, I mean, who doesn't want to be like those people who actually like to drink tea, you know? <laughs> 
I like how he just ended there. That was so good. Test, test. Uh, Milo, can we hand this to... Oh, great. Thank you um, for reminding us that we like don't start with a blank slate. And um, I just wanted to share something that I spent a couple years doing, which was which was um, noticing my morning, my first m waking up mood that was just kind of in my mind. And I kept a journal of, of these moods and watched as they were there and then they went away and then they came, you know, then they shifted to something else. And it was just really powerful um, to reinforce not acting on that first mood, you know, because sometimes I woke up grumpy and then I'd go listen to birds and then I'd get ungrumpy. And then, you know, it was just, um, so I don't know where mood, where that comes in, in the, the cycle, um, but I just, this idea that we don't start our day with a blank slate was so helpful um, to, um, so I, um, I guess the question is part of where does it fit in in all of that? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, Ajahn Nisimbo and I live really close to each other, little huts that are just, I mean, I could throw a rock and you know hit his hut if I wanted to. I don't, I don't. <laughs> but just like, you know, we're around each other a lot and uh, we're just noticing, I mean, it's not just the morning. You know, each of us has times which, uh, yeah, moods are more likely to be triggered and uh, knowing one's own and knowing the mood cycles, the chronology, like the daily cycles of our own and the people who we love, their, their cycles. Sometimes we have something, not, not often, but uh, something called sword time where we don't, yeah, we, we gotta tread lightly when it's sword time for each of us. Um, but yeah, a mood, it's a mix of um, feeling, so it does have that hedonic or affective just impulse, the impulse away from, like, no, it's just not the time. I don't, I don't want to hear any of that, any of what you say. Um, or the pull towards getting away from that, which are both, you know, it's the front and back of a hand. Uh, plus, there is some level of sankara or of this fabrication, this, this makingness of the mind. We're not just, it's not just a mood that we're watching. You know, we're we're turning the crank as well, you know, we see which way the wind is blowing and we lean into it and it becomes me, exactly. That's the identification, that's the craving and the upadana. So it, yeah, it really, mood, the English term, yeah, just confounds and a lot of those different um, aspects just get rolled up together and really the momentum and the um, trajectory of that just can take on its own speed and strength. Yeah, and, and to say, like, you know, the Buddha had different divisions based on what he was talking about, and mapping mood onto the five khandas is a bit easier, because it is sankhara. It's a mix of a bunch of other ones. Sankhara sort of binds things together into a whole mood program. Um, whereas the 12 links, like, they're all interpenetrating to some extent and working at the same time. So there can be a mood present as all that stuff's happening the initial sankara can remain and strengthen and gather momentum like a snowball. But I think what you're pointing to is great where becoming and birth, like knowing the new life, that's a whole, just how much we can believe our moods and the worlds we're born into. And then five minutes later, be like, what was that? You know, and, and I think that humility is such a helpful way of looking at the, the births, you know, so. I think we have time for one more question on Zoom. Um, please. I think we can't hear you. Uh, maybe unmute? Sorry, just a second. Uh, can you try to speak again? What's his name, Tyler? Tyler, what's his name? Melinda? Oh. 
There we go. I can hear you, Melinda. Sorry, I, I wasn't sure if you were talking to no, me. No, you're, you're very far away. I can't read your name, but it is you. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for the discussion, Ajans. Um, there is something I've always struggled to understand in the dependent origination. It's related to these links about clinging. So uh, is it the same as the greed that's more fundamental to the consciousness or is it something that arises because of cause and effect but less fundamental to the consciousness? Thank you. Yeah, clinging is definitely not fundamental to consciousness. Consciousness is just that which knows, um, but it is, it does happen so quickly and yeah, uh, clinging or attachment, this upadana, is the fuel of habit. So like all habits are fueled by, uh, by this clinging. And it, is, it's, it can be very, very deep, but as we were talking about earlier, we come, become more and more conscious based on the mind, just knowing these things, just knowing uh, our own habits that can in itself um, decrease the, the strength of it. And, uh, we start to see deeper and deeper um, habit, habits, deeper and deeper attachments, and um, yeah, the relationship between craving and clinging, yeah, they're right next to each other. And really, in terms of what we can most affect or what we can actually do in practice, the first link of ignorance and that link of craving just before clinging attachment are the ones where we can, yeah, if we just stop the stop the chain, stop the cycle right there, bring some level of knowing that counteracts ignorance and the whole process comes to a stop or stops right there. And then with craving, if we just don't um, yeah, continue that at that step right there, we notice uh, a feeling, we notice that Vedana, and we just don't crave in that direction, that also stops the clinging. So. Yeah, thank you, Melinda. Okay, um, so we'll wrap up. Um.